Hello, everybody. Um, I'm John Reader. I'm the director of the WHO Research for Health Department. And uh, today I want to welcome you to this webinar, which is to discuss the outputs on the Expert Advisory Committee and Developing Global Standards for Governance and Oversight of Human Genome Editing, which reported its, family to, its findings to the DG in July. And I don't think it's exaggerating to you to call this a real leap forward in this rapidly emerging science. However, before I go on in English, as my Spanish is, is very poor, can I draw your attention to the fact we do have simultaneous translation to and from Spanish available. So if you click the little globe at the bottom of the Zoom window, you'll be able to access that. And uh, you, you can pick us up in then either English or Spanish as you wish. Thanks. So I want to start by saying that this is not an isolated topic. And addressing topics like this is an integral part of the WHO transformation that saw the creation of the new science division. The idea being to get WHO ahead of the curve on science and the intent not simply to respond to new health technologies, but to actually engage early and help to shape them so they benefit all. Human genome editing is a great example of an emerging scientific technology that offers huge potential benefits for health, but presents novel scientific issues and has generated considerable community concern. Member states are looking to WHO to advise them on to how to tackle this issue and how to move forward responsibly in this area. We've been lucky because we've had a fantastic committee of 18 experts from all WHO regions working for almost two years in, in this area, wonderfully chaired by Peggy Hamburg and Edwin Cameron. And you're gonna hear directly from some of the members of this committee today about some of the key questions they've addressed, the recommendations they've made. The DG is absolutely committed to acting on this report, not just reading it, but acting upon it. And his charges internally with working across all levels of the organization in an integrated approach to implementation. However, the report also recognizes the burden does not all lie with WHO, and it calls for a collaborative approach with all stakeholders and engagement with the wider uh, community. So thanks once more for your attendance at the event, especially given that the next stage of this work will really need to focus on implementation and understanding the different regional and country uh, perspectives and needs if we want to take this forward successfully. So I'll now pass on to Carla Sens, the Regional Bioethics Advisor uh, from PAHO. Carla, over to you. Thank you uh, very much, John, and all our colleagues from WHO that have worked not only ma making these reports possible, but also this session. I mean, Kat Catherine Littler and Emmanuel Turlings. Voy a cambiar a español ahora. I am switching to Spanish. I'm Carla Science, uh, the Regional Advisor in Bioethics, and it is a great pleasure for our program on bioethics at PAHO to focus on ethics regarding uh, the work on the human genome and editing of the human genome. Re remember that back in 2019, we had five webinars on this topic with different experts from the region. In 2020, we contributed to the consultations from WHO, even translating the contributions that were sent in Spanish and translating them in, into English. And in May, we started with our webinars with a conversation about communication in um, genetic editing and communications. This is extremely important for our region and all these activities have been carried out because we are very invested in participating in the global dialogue, taking into consideration our um, participation from Latin America and the Caribbean in uh, reflection on genetic aspects, we would like to take this moment to remember Ana Sanchez Urrutis, who was a member of the um, panel of experts established by WHO for global standards for um, human genome editing. And she was the person representing Latin America and the Caribbean, and we remember her. She died last August. It was an early um, demise, and she was an early collaborator of the bioethics program. She was a leader in Panama in bioethics, and she was able to combine um, the exercise of bioethics with the academic portion and research. She was very proud to be 
part of the um, uh, WHO panel of experts. And I remember she told me that when she was interviewed for TV, they asked her very candidly why uh, were Panamanians interested in genome editing? And she gave an example. She said that one of the uses of genome editing that is being studied is to um, cure um, uh, sickle cell anemia that affects many Panamanians. And this opened up new ideas and perceptions changed. So this stopped being something from another planet to become something that interested everyone. We should all be interested in, genetic, in genomic edition. The, um, uh, human, the heritable human genome is very important. And she was especially interested in this. Uh, so we will follow in her footsteps. We have two members, uh, Francoise, Professor Francoise Belize from the University of Dalhouse, Canada, and uh, Dr. Jamie Metzl from the Atlantic Council and One Share World from the United States. They will both uh, present the report from the um, um, expert advisory committee. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today in what I hope will be an engaging uh, intervention. It's an opportunity for us to very briefly share with you a summary of the work and then we're hopeful that you'll engage in conversation with us. What you see on the slide right now is the list of committee members. And as you can see, a fair bit of diversity around the world. And again, I want to express our condolences to Anna's family. Many committee members were deeply grateful for her contributions and saddened by her passing. Next slide, please. The work of the committee spanned a couple of years and was extremely comprehensive. We had a number of face-to-face -face meetings. On occasion, the group as a whole would break up into subgroups so that we could work on particular areas of interest. Owing to the pandemic, we were able to turn, if you will, to benefit from the opportunity of online consultations, which we were able to do. And one of the things you'll hear about in this presentation is the Human Genome Editing Registry. And one of the things that's very important about that is that it came into play as a pilot even before our final reports were released. We had two satellite meetings. These were meetings hosted in conjunction with other established meetings and two online consultations on the governance framework. Next slide, please. One of the things to appreciate in the report is the scope of the topic. The specific charge from the Director General was to address somatic, germline, and heritable genome editing. And you can see on the slide a very brief description of the scope of those three areas of work and research. The charge from the Director General was also broad in that we were asked to address scientific ethical and social issues of governance and to do this on a global scale. One of the things that was particularly challenging given the broad scope was paying attention to the likely different time horizons for this kind of research moving from the lab into the real world at the bedside. So somatic genome editing of the kind you've already heard mention of with the example of sickle cell disease is currently happening. We are in clinical trials and the hope is that this research will be successful and will move into the possibility of therapeutic applications. Germline editing, which is the research happening in the lab with things like egg, sperm, their precursor cells and early embryos is currently happening and expanding. The important difference between germline and heritable is that it's the same basic science, but with heritable human genome editing, the material that has been genetically altered is transferred to a uterus 
for reproduction. So that's the scope of the report. Next slide, please. One of the things that's really important to appreciate about the work of the committee is that we did not work in isolation and then at the end of several years, simply issue a report. Early on, the committee determined that it was important to have information about what research was actually happening. And so there was a proposal for a clinical trials registry and that came online long before the final report was issued. Along the way, the committee heard rumors and then learned in some publications that there were plans for going forward with the kind of research that I have described for you as heritable human genome editing. The committee made a recommendation to the director general to issue a statement and the director general did so. This was in July of 2019, where he made a statement that it would be irresponsible to use genetically altered embryos for reproduction. Most recently in July, 2021, we have in fact been able to publish our work. One of the important things is the governance framework. And then we have a separate document that lists nine explicit recommendations for governance and oversight. And we'll be talking about that work now. Next slide, please. We've used what's called a framework approach. And our goal here has been to identify a range of issues and to try to identify a number of mechanisms that could usefully help us to address these issues. An overarching goal was to make sure that the framework would be what we determine as scalable, sustainable, and appropriate for use at the institutional, national, regional, and environmental levels. In other words, we need to have mechanisms that can work in all parts of the world, including parts of the world where there's traditionally weaker regulation of scientific and clinical research and practice. So again, the overarching goal is to provide individuals, organizations with tools and guidance. Next slide, please. This shows you just the structure of the governance framework. It is available on the web, and I encourage you to have a look at the framework. It's a long document by some standards, a short document by others. I'd like to believe that it's reasonably comprehensive and thus helpful. Next slide, please. One of the things that's very important in developing a governance framework is to have an understanding of the background situation or conditions. And one of the things that's important to appreciate is that we're not starting with a blank slate. The rules for research in the area of germline inheritable interventions differ around the world. What you see here is a snapshot in time. This was published in October, 2020. There have since been a few changes and this shows the different policy situations in a variety of countries, specifically for germline editing. That's the research happening in the lab. Next slide. Notice here, again, the rules differ around the world. And here the map is representing policy for heritable human genome editing. This is when the research moves from the lab into a clinical setting for the purpose of reproduction. Next slide. The governance framework is grounded in ethical values and principles. And I think one of the things that's especially important to appreciate here is that we looked at what would be described as procedural values and principles and substantive values and principles. On the left-hand side, you see the list of principles that are to inform how decisions are made. And on the other side, the list of values and principles that are supposed to inform what decisions are made. The important message here is that we took these values and principles and essentially drag them through the document and refer back to them repeatedly stating, given that we care about these specific values and principles, these are the kinds of recommendations we're able to make. Next slide, please. One of the things that we do in this framework is try to address human genome editing research in a number of different domains. 
One of the things we looked at is somatic human genome editing. And as you can see here, we've identified the fact that this research can happen postnatally, meaning in humans that walk amongst us, but also prenatally, an intervention on the fetus in utero. Also concerns about heritable human genome editing, where we would be creating humans with select traits, human genetic editing, and human enhancement. Next slide, please. One of the other important things about the governance framework is that we encourage individuals, organizations, governments, policymakers to understand that a framework can be much more than typical legal mechanisms. And so it's not just declarations, treaties, legislation, it's not just judicial uh, rulings or ministerial decrees, but there are many other ways, in fact, through which we are able to regulate the practice of science. And you see here, I think, a very interesting, though probably not comprehensive list. But the point here is to say that there are many ways in which we can try to govern, and govern human genome editing. Next slide, please. Another thing that we did because the goal was to be helpful was not only to list a number of possible tools, mechanisms, values, and principles, but also to provide a number of possible scenarios. And the idea here is to actually demonstrate how the elements of our governance framework could come together in practice. And so the scenarios actually illustrate a number of practical challenges. They ask questions about how one might resolve these challenges they point to the values and principles that might come into play. And so, for example, we explore different facets of the governance puzzle, regulation, inclusiveness, equitable access, et cetera. For us, in the context of working on these scenarios, it really became a useful tool to test the utility of the governance framework. And so what you had here is a little bit of what I would describe as a dialectical process the scenarios allowed us to improve our foundational ideas. Our foundational ideas allowed us to help address challenges in the scenarios. Next slide, please. The scenarios are in a number of different areas, but one of the things I draw to your attention is the preponderance of scenarios addressing somatic human genome editing. The reason for this is you'll recall, I mentioned earlier, that there's a difference in terms of the timeline or the horizon for this work research moving from a lab or a research environment into a clinical context. And it's somatic human genome editing that is likely to be most useful in the immediate near term. And in that context, you'll see a number of scenarios. One looking at clinical trials for sickle cell disease, another at clinical trials for Huntington's disease. But in that context, we then also were very worried about the premature offering of certain kinds of interventions. And so we have a case involving unscrupulous entrepreneurs and clinics. And we have an early case looking at the move from anything that might be thought of as therapeutic to enhancement. And the illustration here is with respect to athletic ability. There's a case on heritable human genome editing and also a case on prenatal in utero somatic human genome editing. Next slide, please. And at this point, I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Jamie, who's going to take you through each of these recommendations in turn. The one general point I would make is that all of the first eight recommendations are directly in response to the mandate given to the committee by the director general. And I think that one of the things that becomes important is that last one, the eighth one, which is to actually take the work on ethical values and principles and use it beyond the topic of human genome editing. Over to you, Jamie. Thanks so much, Francoise, and thank you, Carla and John, and thank you to all of you for, uh, for being here and what we believe is a really important conversation. Before I go through the recommendations uh, briefly, I just want to start where John began, uh, which is highlighting that we are at a pretty significant inflection point for uh, our human habitation on Earth because our technologies are becoming incredibly powerful, uh, the rate of um, increase, the rate of expansion of our technologies is exponential. 
Um, and what we're struggling with is a mismatch between our exponential technologies and our culture, cultural and governance and regulatory environments, which aren't moving as quickly. And what that does is it changes uh, a little bit or even significantly the way that we need to think about governance. Uh, because if, if the governance structures are too slow to develop the gulf between the technological capabilities and the, and the governance systems um, defined broadly as Francoise just described, will be too great. And there'll be a lot of bad things that can happen in that space, which is including unethical scientific activities, um, but also a loss of faith among the general public and publics um, uh, into, in how our, our governing, governing institutions uh, can function at, at all levels. And that really informed the work that we were doing and that's why John's initial point that this is connected to the broader realm of frontier science and, and technology, and that's, that's really uh, important. So uh, next slide, please. I'll go through our, our recommendations relatively quickly. The first is that um, we all know uh, that the World Health Organization is a, an absolutely essential organization in the world, um, but it doesn't have any really significant control um, uh, over national states. Uh, and so because of that, um, the, the, the role of the WHO and its director general to set an agenda, to try to, to help push along our process of articulating norms and standards, we believe is particularly important. And that's why our first recommendation was that the WHO and the director general um, are very open about the opportunities and challenges in human genome editing. It's easy to go to one extreme or the other. Uh, this is all negative or it's all positive, but the truth of the matter is that there is a very positive story here, um, but there are very significant potential downsides. And our goal is to optimize the upsides and minimize any potential harms. And the agenda setting and the norm setting of the WHO and the DG is, is critical. Um, but that's why uh, articulating and discussing the ethical issues really at every level uh, continuously are critically important. Uh, and also outlining the downsides, being honest about failures, including um, in very powerful nation states um, is, is very important. Next slide, please. Um, in, as this stresses what Francoise has already said, International uh, collaboration is absolutely essential for effective governance and oversight. And because of that, we believe that the WHO should collaborate with other international bodies and we, and we list them. Um, and that the WHO and the DG can play a critically important role in instituting a cross-institutional approach, um, which brings together member states, which brings together uh, different international uh, organizations, and the good news is that the WHO already has a framework for doing that. We don't feel that we need to, to um, quote unquote, reinvent the wheel. What we need to do is ask, what are the most relevant structures that exist? And how can we make sure that we maximally use those to address this, uh, in part, new set of technologies and technological challenges? And that's why the science division, uh, which also reflects that we believe is critically important uh, to this process. And that's why we've called on the DG to task the science division to convene a series of meetings, including with each of the six WHO regional offices, regulators, uh, medical and scientific leaders, patient groups, civil society organizations, and other uh, relevant bodies. This is not, uh, this is the kind of issue um, where we need to move forward together and in an inclusive man manner. Uh, and that means from the beginning, it's not that um, we, whether it's government leaders or the WHO, uh, present findings to society. We really need to engage, empower, and engage uh, at every level. Next slide, please. Uh, Francoise mentioned this. Uh, one of our first recommendations um, was the establishment of uh, human genome editing registries. And we, we discussed this quite a bit over the two years. Uh, and it was uh, really helpful uh, the, that the WHO could begin a pilot project in, while our, um, uh, our task for our, our experts group was still convened. We think it's, it's very, very important uh, because information will allow um, uh, not just regulatory bodies, but universities, hospitals, uh, even the general public 
uh, to be able to have informed conversation about what should and should not be happening. And again, uh, this is not a thing where we or anyone, I believe, is saying uh, human genome editing in every conceivable circumstance is wrong and should be banned. Um, what we're saying is uh, certainly we're not ready for it now, but very likely, personal view, there will be a time um, when, uh, when we will be ready for it, at least in some, uh, in some limited ways. And at that time, there needs to be maximal transparency, and there need, which will allow, uh, if we have the right infrastructures in place, for a balancing at, at every level uh, of the risks and benefits of every, uh, of every conceivable intervention. Next slide, please. International research and medical travel, uh, we believe is, is critically important. We've seen with so many other uh, technologies uh, that international research um, can be an opportunity uh, to go to places where there aren't strong regulatory infrastructures and do things that would not be possible in a home environment. And so we, we were very mindful about um, raising cautions about that in medical travel. Um, I think we've all seen with unethical stem cell research that often happens in places that are regulatory uh, black holes, um, that there's a real danger because what we're talking about is not just systemic interventions for the individual. Um, we're also talking about systemic interventions uh, that can, uh, can in, at least in a small way in the beginning, but even less small ways over time, uh, change the evolutionary trajectory of our species. And because of that, we really need to think uh, of a, a, a one world, uh, one world approach. And so we need to look carefully at international research and medical travel. Next slide. Uh, illegal, unregistered, unethical, or unsafe research and, and, uh, and other activities. Um, I'm just gonna read this one because it's particularly important and technical, um, but we believe that the WHO with advice from the New Science Council should charge the science division to lead an effort to create a multi-sector collaboration to develop an accessible mechanism for confidential reporting of concerns about possibly illegal, unregistered, unethical and unsafe human genome editing research and other activities. Um, uh, that it's critically, critically important. As I said, where these technologies are extremely powerful and transparency and accountability will be the key, not just to effective governance, but making sure that we can move forward together in ways that maintain public trust in our institutions, uh, in our science, and that we can develop applications of these technologies um, that are helpful to people and avoid the kinds of, of harms that we've already seen. Next slide, please. Intellectual property is particularly important. Uh, we also believe uh, that it creates uh, some additional levers uh, that could effectively be used to promote uh, the most ethical and appropriate application of these technologies. Uh, that's why we believe that in collaboration with other international organizations, uh, the World, in, uh, World Intellectual Property or, uh, Organization, the WTO, uh, and others, the, the WHO should encourage relevant patent holders to help ensure equitable access to human genome editing interventions, but not just equitable access, also the ethical application of these uh, technologies norm setting and holding meetings uh, and in that, uh, in that process, uh, we believe are really important because we've, we're now seeing with the vaccines how intellectual property uh, plays a very important role in determining who has access to what and at what time. Next slide, please. Education engagement and empowerment is something I personally, and I know Francoise and, and many of us felt was very, very important. These technologies are so powerful and so significant uh, for all of us, for everyone on earth, uh, that it's not enough for even the most well-meaning uh, scientists and government officials to make decisions on behalf of everybody. But if we want to have inclusive decision-making, we need to make that possible. And that's why education, engagement, are critically important to empower people to join the conversation. Uh, but empowerment is equally Im important because this isn't just sharing information. Uh, people at all levels 
need to be part of the decision-making process. So they need to be empowered to do so. And we need to make sure that we have structures in place um, where the voices of everyone uh, can be heard. And particularly it's a challenge uh, because there are many people around the world who don't even have access uh, to uh, digital means of, uh, of communication, but reaching everybody and engaging everybody and empowering everybody is critically important to moving forward together. Next slide, please. Ethical values and principles for use by the WHO, as we went through our work, it became clear um, that what we were trying to do was articulate a broader set of ethical values and, and principles uh, that could guide what we were doing. And, um, and it was clear that every other um, uh, ex uh, WHO convened expert group was in one way or another doing the same thing. And so while I think we all feel we know what the, the WHO stands for, we believe it would be important to codify that into a set of, of values and principles um, that would guide the work of all of these, um, of these types of, uh, of expert advisory groups. That doesn't mean that it would be set in stone, um, but that articulating it would be a very important starting point for future efforts. Next slide, please. So this is just a list of some of those ethical values and, uh, and principles. And these, uh, these we believe are critically important, um, but they could change over time. Uh, and that's why we need to have an ongoing process, but uh, ethics and values, certainly the advance of science and the application of this science in China and perhaps elsewhere um, was the impetus for the establishment of our committee. But what our committee was ultimately about um, was the application of ethical values and principles to this revolutionary science. And we believe to all revolutionary science. And that's why, while well, this is a start, uh, we believe there's a great deal of work to be done going forward. So um, I'll just stop there, but let me say uh, the official, I've, I've done a lot of, um, of common, my own personal commentary in what I've just described. Uh, the, uh, please refer to the report for our official positions. Um, but now this report uh, is, is complete and we're going to have a regular review process. We've called on that. But we really feel it's up to all of you, certainly in the WHO regional centers and the people who are receiving the report and the ideas to make these ideas your own, to be part of this conversation about the best ways forward. So thank you so much and let me stop there. Muchas gracias, Jamie. Thank you very much, Jamie and Francois. Now let's move into our final discussion. And for the first part of this section, Sofia Salas, Dr. Sofia Salas, who is a professor from the bioethics department of the development uh, part of the German uh, medical clinical uh, department uh, at that university. She collaborates uh, with PAHO and WHO and bioethics. And so thank you very much, Sophia, for taking part in this discussion. I give you the floor. So I would encourage everyone to share their questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Carla, for giving me the opportunity to pose some topics of discussion that uh, we've deemed important regionally regarding the framework that WHO has proposed. Now, this uh, document uh, explores a number of challenges, five, in fact, that we've been talking about uh, postnatal uh, genome editing, somatic, uh, inheritable uh, germline epigenetic uh, editing and uh, enhancement editing. Again, these techniques can be used uh, for enhancement purposes, whether we're talking about germlines or fetal enhancements, not just um, germ cells, but in my view, 
what in the region we call um, confusing apples and oranges, what are the most uh, relevant ethical issues? It would be for reproductive purposes using this uh, genome editing, heritable genome editing. Now, from the standpoint of ethical uh, research, this does have particular meaning. If research is done in somatic cells, the ethic, uh, ethical uh, considerations are very similar to any other type of uh, research uh, when you're talking about a novel technique. And we have to assess and strike a, uh, that is risks entailed and strike a balance between uh, risks and benefits. Given that this technique um, being new, uh, risks are greater. Now, when this is done at the fetal level, we're talking about uh, somatic cells, it can be used to solve grave uh, disease, serious diseases, but the focus has to be uh, uh, how serious the condition you seek to uh, correct is, is uh, and whether it uh, is worth the risk. Now, in uh, germ line cells for uh, reproductive uh, purposes and what the consequences are for future generations. This is a technique that uh, isn't 100% sure or safe yet uh, that uh, entails additional ethical concerns. So this can be used uh, to solve a serious disease to prevent disease. So are we talking about um, inheritable uh, lines, uh, somatic um, cells? Now, in the WHO document about ethic, ethical uh, concerns, when talking about uh, genome editing in somatic cells. Now, the document addresses uh, dishonest clinics, also um, medical tourism that people engage in uh, to solve problems that can't be solved uh, in one's country, illegal research, uh, unsafe or unregistered uh, research, unproven therapeutic uh, interventions that have not been uh, tested and therefore are inherently unsafe. Now, these are challenges given that these are unproven uh, techniques in some cases, in trunk cells and medical treatments that aren't yet available in one's uh, own country that tend to be very expensive and that induces people to go elsewhere to try to solve their health problems. And that's not always done in a safe way. So these are some of the uh, aspects highlighted in, highlighted in the document, which uh, we see are in common with other interventions. It's not something that is exclusively um, of the realm of gene, genome, human genome uh, editing. It also talks about the need for there to be a registry uh, for research in this new therapy. So WHO should ensure that uh, clinical trials that use um, human genome editing uh, be approved to uh, be on this registry, that there be a monitoring committee in place, that the uh, keywords be identified, and that uh, there be a registry uh, for basic and preclinical information. Now, is this to be an exclusive one? or that is um, a standalone, or should the ones that exist just be made more robust to include human genome editing? Also, the report highlights uh, some uh, value commitments uh, that have been, uh, that should be taken on, uh, inclusiveness, precaution, uh, social justice, non-discrimination, 
everyone uh, being treated with the same moral value, respect for people, solidarity, and global health justice. Now, all these principles are shared values with all research done on human beings. They are not exclusive um, in human genome editing. There are some specific ethical considerations when talking about somatic cells. Now, whether we're talking about something that's uh, done for uh, gene editing, uh, for using it uh, as a form of chemotherapy, and these ethical considerations should be similar to that of uh, any new experimental therapy. There should be a risk um, benefit uh, balance that uh, is favorable. There should be informed consent and uh, the subjects of such research uh, and how they are selected should be done fairly. Uh, and this needs to be done such that the population be better informed. A lot of people think that the genetics uh, hold out the promise for cures, and we need to um, bring people down to earth uh, regarding what the true therapeutic uh, benefits uh, of this might be. There are also false fears on the other extreme rooted in science fiction uh, in which people get their ideas about uh, what use can be made of this technology. And also, uh, human genome editing should not be used for non-medical conditions. Again, there has to be a balance between risk and benefits, favoring benefits. Now, EGH, or human genome editing in somatic cells, is already in the clinical phase. And so this, uh, when done, has to be done in a safe, transparent, way and uh, made available to the largest number of people possible. The same considerations uh, relate to uh, fetal genetic therapy. The fetus, uh, as regards the fetus receiving the intervention, And we're talking about uh, those diseases for which there is no um, effective uh, cure with a high mortality rate. And the same considerations need to be kept in mind uh, when considering any type of um, research involving fetuses. So in germ cells, editing, and you have a more focused approach, we're talking about those uh, without uh, reproductive purposes and then those with reproductive purposes, which can affect the following generation. Now, in our view, for non-reproductive uh, purposes, the ethical, ethical considerations are similar to that in any research done with human embryos with the uh, full consent of the parents, as well as uh, uh, allowing for, that is, if they give their consent uh, for the destruction of healthy embryos. Now, for uh, for producing uh, trunk cells or hybrid uh, cells, now on uh, reproductive uh, cases, safety is uh, of the utmost concern, not just for the one uh, embryo involved, but for future generations. Also raised is the possible use of this technique for enhancements, not really to solve or cure um, medical ailments. And uh, on that, there has been a moratorium established. Now, problem, the problem with any new technology, and this is a new technology, is that there is a tension clearly between promoting innovation and the desire to forge ahead uh, quickly and precaution in uh, ensuring its efficacy and safety. That means to uh, advance with caution and slowly. So, so germ line uh, editing calls for the utmost uh, precaution. Now, when uh, using somatic cells from fetuses, similar considerations have to be borne in mind uh, as in other 
types of research, because in our view, this would not call for a new governance, but rather to uh, use what is already in place. Now, on there are um, philosophical concerns, uh, and this needs to be uh, further discussed. Civil society has a role here, not just scientists or leaders, whether of the WHO or PAHO. Uh, everyone needs to be involved in the discussion, the decision regarding what the limits are for the acceptable or unacceptable use of this technology in the scientific community with the support of important organizations such as WHO should ensure that this research and its application in human beings be done safely and responsibly. My closing words are to say that this framework document in a diverse world, countries and regions, taking into account the cultural, historic, religious aspects are going to opt for different regulatory approaches on this subject matter. That's why it's important for us to correctly identify what the values and principles that um, guide decisions are and to focus on WHO governance uh, where it's uh, necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sofia, for your presentation which has touched on some very, the region of the Americas. I would like to invite Catherine Litt Littler from the ethics uh, unit of WHO, Francois, to join the dialogue. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but I do think there are a number of questions uh, that have been posed and so perhaps the best way to start would be to give an opportunity to the members of the community. Many questions were uh, raised by Sofia that uh, elicit a response. You've got the germinal uh, germ cell uh, treatment as well as um, somatic cell treatment. Um, germline. Now, some of these questions aren't in English, and so I understand that uh, reading the Q&A, not everyone can uh, read and understand them all. There's one about ethics dumping. There's another one that is uh, in Spanish that talks about how to ensure that the benefit of research also be available uh, made available to countries um, low-income countries i think that's a good start for a conversation and then we will um, pose other questions i don't know who would like to start well uh, i'm happy to jump in quickly um so thank you so much carla um one of the questions i saw was how can regular people get involved it seems so big and that there are the, these big issues of science, um, then there's a gulf between what's happening in the scientific world and even with a small number of regulators and normal people who don't have that kind of, of background. And for that, one of the things that we can do is look at countries and environments that do a particularly good job of public engagement and ask, well, what are the questions that we can, uh, can learn? And that was one of the areas that we focused on in our deliberations. And we heard um, from uh, the, the uh, Danish uh, the bioethics community, and they have a really fantastic model in Denmark of having highly informed public consultations on very complex scientific issues that have done an excellent job of bringing people in uh, to these, these conversations. And, and I believe it's not coincidental that now uh, Denmark is having one of the most effective um, responses to COVID-19, including uh, because there's a very informed and engaged public 
um, that has been um, brought into the, the conversation and, and the process. So we certainly believe that there are structural mechanisms that can be set in place um, that are empowering. And that's, what, that's an area where the World Health Organization has a, a critically important role to play of bringing together these kinds of best practices. And the regional offices also are essential in, in taking these bigger ideas and helping countries and communities tailor them to their needs. And if I can, I'll just jump in with respect to the other question about ethics dumping. And I want to assure everyone that this was a topic that was discussed at great length by the committee. Certainly in the context of governance, we were aware of what we might describe as policy gaps. We were also aware that there are differentials between different countries around the world, both in terms of the kinds of research they want to pursue, but also the kinds of research they want to permit. And also in that context, you will have seen that one of the recommendations, and Jamie spoke to this in the slide presentation, was about what to do when you have information about activities that you believe are illegal or unethical or harmful, et cetera. At the end of the day, um, you know, a number of possible you know, specific mechanisms were discussed. But the recommendation to WHO that it was that in the short term, that it could perhaps serve, if you will, as a concierge. That may not be the right term, but the idea is that it would be a place where concerns could be reported. And then the WHO, which has no authority in terms of actually trying to resolve those issues, would then be able hopefully to get it to the right address. At this point, I think we recognize that it is a complicated issue largely because we are dealing with a complicated uh, policy environment and also a complicated multicultural world. So I think the report acknowledges that this is an issue, this is a problem, it does have to do with power differentials, it does have to do with capacity within different countries and regions, and we don't want to walk away from it. The other thing that we do specifically emphasize is the importance of having mechanisms that protect those who want to come forward and actually make an allegation or report a concern. So there was concern there that the mechanisms be fair, that they be accountable, et cetera. So that may not be the solution, but I don't think anyone has an obvious solution. I think our work was to name it, to legitimize it, to find a specific role for WHO to receive that information as a uh, non-interested party in the strict sense of having vested interests and for WHO to get that information to the right address. Thank you so much. I don't know if Catherine, you want to add something on your end on WHO's plan to move forward specifying and clarifying ethical guidelines for germline for her heritable gene editing. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of that question because I had my translation device on. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> That's my fault. <laughs> uh, so one of the questions that we received is uh, what is WHO's plan to move forward specifying and clarifying ethical guidelines for germline heritable gene editing? So I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that. I'll offer a first remark, but I'm sure Jamie will want to weigh in. Um, one of the things that you would also have seen in the slide deck is a reference to public uh, education engagement and empowerment. And in large part, that was a messaging to the WHO to say that the work does not end with the tabling, if you will, of final reports. And you've also heard from Jamie that WHO's uh, Director General has not only listened and received our recommendations, but has said that um, he will act on those recommendations. So I think a beginning part of that is having these kinds of conversations, webinars, making members of the committee available uh, to different communities that have an interest, continuing to hear back. Um, but yes, the goal is to have this be an ongoing conversation. And you'll also remember that uh, one of the last recommendations was to say that this work should be reviewed on a cyclical basis. And so that was very much to make sure that this doesn't sort of just end up on someone's uh, bookshelf. And, and, and I'll just quickly add to that, that the reason why our committee existed at all uh, was because of the leadership of the director general and the senior, senior leadership of the WHO. So they very, very much understand the importance and the urgency uh, of this. 
Um, but our, their understanding and our understanding is that our report was just a first step in a much longer journey. And so I think we're all on the same page in that. And, and that's why uh, regional, the engagement of regional offices is so important. Um, our uh, report and our work will fail. It will be a failure unless it's seen as a spark for an ongoing process. This isn't a, a one and done type of activity. It's something where we need to bring more people into the conversation and the process needs to grow from, uh, from the conversation, from articulating principles uh, to developing norms and structures and institutions, national laws and other things. But I'd also love to hear Catherine um, speak to that about the, the commitment of the WHO uh, for moving forward. Thanks, Jamie. I'll be quick, Carla, because I'm conscious of time, but I do think it's really important to make the point that um, these webinars and engagement with regional officers and more widely are critical to our implementation strategy. Not only are we looking to implement the recommendations, but also understand how they're fit for purpose in different settings and where we have to put different emphasis. And that may also mean that there are, as Anna pointed out in her question, uh, do we need to look at additional ethical guidance or additional work in this space? Um, but I think a full understanding of regional and country level needs is a critical step in our implementation. And I think there are some short term things we can do. And then there are some clearly some of the recommendations are uh, medium and longer term. And that's what we need to work out over the next three to six months. And I'll stop there and back to you, Carla. Gracias, uh, Catherine. Uh, hay una pregunta Thank you, Catherine. There is another question. I don't know if you have something brief to say about implementation plans for the registry. You mentioned the registry. Could you perhaps share something as a last word uh, before we close about the registry? Um, the registry uh, exists right now in what we would call a pilot phase. And this is with respect to clinical applications. And one of the recommendations is to think about ways in which that can be made more secure and more robust. So there are limitations at this point, but what is important is that it's available and the expectation hope is that people will voluntarily register the research that they're conducting. You'll, if you think back to some of the things we said about the framework and other ways of governance, our hope and expectation is that uh, being included in the registry will be a requirement for publication. That's another way in which you can try to have a broad understanding of governance. Um, at the same time, there's concern that it's not necessarily easy to find everything that should be in the registry and that there may be things in the registry that shouldn't be there, that people are using this as a way to um, get themselves some kind of credibility. So I think the point is right now it's up and running. It's in a pilot phase. The hope is that it will be made more robust and in time that it might broaden to other areas of research. Muchísimas gracias. Estamos ya con la hora. Gracias. And thank you very much. We have come to the end of our meeting. Uh, thank you all the participants and the interpreters uh, for their help in allowing us to have a dialogue in two languages and all those who supported us in this meeting. We hope this is one more step in the regional dialogue on this topic. And we invite you to continue to participate in these sessions to please uh, sign up in the bioethic lists uh, from PAHO, we are constantly sharing material and encouraging this uh, larger regional dialogue. So good afternoon, goodbye uh, to all.